Hebrews chapter 2, uh, verses 17 and 18. But I'm going to start reading in verse 16. So if you have your spot and you're able and you're willing, uh, please stand for the reading of God's holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. Hebrews 2, starting in verse 16. For surely not the angels did he receive to himself or help, but he came to help the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he was made in the likeness of his brothers in every way, that he might be merciful and faithful as a priest concerning the things of God, unto propitiation of the sins of his people. And therefore in his suffering. Because in his suffering he was tested and tempted, he is able to grant help to those who also, like us, are tested. You may be seated. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that we would appreciate this passage more than we have coming into this message, maybe. I pray, Lord, that maybe for the first time we would see how Christ became like us in every way. The Messiah who is like us in every way, at your right hand, the one who is interceding for us and serving us and ministering to us still from heaven. Lord, I pray that the words that go out of my mouth, that you would use them, that you would take away everything that is wrong, that you would guard Redemption Life Bible Church, from anything that I say that is not true or not the fullness of truth, guard them from anything that I say that might lead them astray. But what I say that is true and is biblical, Lord, I pray that you would take it and that you would drive it into our hearts like a double-edged sword, that it would convict us, that it would lead us to repentance and faith in our crucified and risen Messiah, Jesus. I pray that it would lead us into transformed lives, that we would be people of Christ, living and dwelling in the kingdom of God here on earth. I pray that we would be different, God, that we would not look like the world because we don't belong to the world anymore. Our citizenship is in heaven. We belong to a new world, the world to come, over which Christ is head already, reigning and governing with all power and all authority. So help me, Lord. Give me words that honor you, faithfully teach your word, and give our church ears that hear and hearts that love and rejoice at this word, and minds that are attentive, because your word is worthy of our attention. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. When we think about the story of Scripture, it becomes apparent over time that there are three particular offices that exist in the relationship between God and men. And sometimes these are explained or they're seen in a more formal way, or sometimes it's less formal. But in their formal sense, inaugurated in the Old Testament church Israel, we see kings like David. Kings who rule over the people of God in accordance with the law of God. But then we see prophets like Elijah and Elisha and Isaiah and Jeremiah, and they Come bringing God and his word to the people, proclaiming prophetic messages, which historically have been divided into two types or two kinds. Forthtelling, which is preaching proper, pointing to God's law and pointing to their sin and calling them to repentance and faith. That's what the prophets did. Calling them to repentance and faith and obedience to their covenant Lord, Yahweh. But the prophets also came foretelling or promising or prophesying in a different sense, meaning pointing to God's promises that are for his people that have a future fulfillment in time and in history. So we have kings and we have prophets, but we have another office as well in the Bible. We have prophets, another P word, and kings. What is that P word? Priests. Prophets, priests, and kings. Priests like Aaron and his children in the line of Levi, the Levitical priesthood. 
So these are the three offices that we see in Scripture. And what we learn as the story of Scripture unfolds is that these three offices that are disconnected and spread out in the Old Testament, all of them together point to a unique person. A unique person who will be prophet, priest, and king. And who is this person, church? The Lord Jesus Christ. And Hebrews has been teaching us this already from the beginning. If you've been here, if you've been listening, or or online, if you've been homesick, or, or whatever it is. But Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, is this person to whom these threefold offices have been pointing all along since their inauguration. And when I say informal, I mean that there are priestly activities happening in the Bible well before the priesthood. For example, what does Job do for his children? In Job 1, he acts as a priest. He offers sacrifices on their behalf, right? What does Abel do in Genesis 4 after the fall? He offers a sacrifice that is pleasing to God, right? These are priestly activities that are informal. It's not yet called the priesthood, but that's coming later under Moses. But the point is that up to this point in Hebrews, we have been taught how the Son of God is already fulfilling these offices from the church's history. For example, Hebrews 1, 1 through 2, and these are not on the screen. Uh, these are just in your Bible in front of you. Anything in Hebrews is just your responsibility. Hebrews 1, 1 through 2a says this, Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he, that is God, has spoken to us by his son. Meaning what? That this son, through whom God has spoken finally and climactically, he is a prophet. He is the prophet of God who comes bearing witness to all the word of God. And then Hebrews taught us in Hebrews 1, 3, It says, after making purification for sins, that's a priestly activity, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And what does that teach us? It teaches us that Jesus is not just prophet who comes bringing the word of God at the end of the age, but that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of his father in the place of a king. And we know this because... We know it even more specifically because the writer of Hebrews is going to quote numerous psalms proving this point. Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 and 2 Samuel 7, all pointing us to this son as king, as Davidic king in the line of David in fulfillment of the promises that God has made to David. So we know that he's a prophet. He is the one who has come in the last days, not just bringing the word of God, but he has come as the word of God. Right? John 1, in the beginning was the Logos, the Word. And the Word, John 1, 14, became flesh. flesh. And he literally tabernacles among us. He is the Word of God in the flesh, the final witness and testimony of God in the person of Jesus Christ. But he is also the Davidic king who has ascended to the right hand of the majesty on high to rule forever on the throne of David. But now in our text today, Hebrews 2, 17 and 18, the writer of Hebrews teaches us that the son is not just prophet and he is not just king, but this son is a priest. And more specifically, he is the high priest. So in light of that, I have five goals today. And here they are. First, we must consider what a priest is since Jesus is called the high priest. Second, and directly connected uh, to that, as we will see, we need to consider what it means that he had to become like his brothers in all things, in every way. That's what it says. We need to discover what that means exactly. Third, we need to consider how he is merciful and faithful as a high priest. Fourth, we need to consider what exactly he accomplished in his sacrifice as a priest, which needs to be unpacked because of the way we translate that word there. Uh, And then finally, I want to end by showing us 
the present ministry of our high priest from heaven. Meaning that our high priest's job, his ministry was not finished in its full sense after his death on the cross. But that he is still ministering. The high priest in heaven is still serving his people. And I want us to see that in conclusion. So first, what is a priest in the Bible? Well, in simplest terms, if the prophets brought God to the people in the proclamation of his word, the preaching of his law and gospel, and if the kings exercised the rule of God over the people of God, ruling by his law, then the priest brings the people to God. So think about the prophets bringing God to the people and the priests bringing the people to God, into the presence of God, bringing the people before God, before the throne of God, which is symbolized in the tabernacle and the temple, and most specifically the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies, which is a type of the throne of God on heaven, or in, from heaven on earth in the Holy of Holies. So the priests, most basically and generically, represent the people of God in the presence of God. And the high priest does so in particular. It's the priests who offer sacrifices daily for the people of God, on their behalf in the presence of God. And it's the high priest who goes into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kephar the day of covering, the day of propitiation and appeasing to make sacrifice and cleansing for their sins, the high priest's sins, and the sins of the people that they represent. So in simplest terms, when you think about priests in Scripture, think about the priest or even the high priest as the one who represents the people of God in the presence of God and specifically in relationship to sin and sacrifice. Sin and sacrifice, which means that the priesthood was a horribly bloody job. You think your local butcher has a bloody job. The priesthood was worse. Constantly offering blood sacrifices before the face of God. And just in case there is any question about the priest or the high priest representing the people of God before the presence of God, I want you to understand that the names of the twelve tribes... The names of the people of God who were in covenant with God, they were written on the breastplate of the priest, the high priest. When the high priest went in, he literally carried the people upon his shoulders. He carried them close to his heart into the presence of God. Exodus 28, 29. It says, So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel, in the breastpiece of judgment, on his heart, when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. And we have to remember, we have to understand that all along this reality, this priesthood and the high priest and all that it symbolized, it was preparing us for the coming of the Messiah, who is Jesus. It is the Messiah typified or foreshadowed in Aaron and his sons and the priesthood at large. The Messiah who would come as high priest, representing his people before God, carrying them near to his heart, their names inscribed upon his breastplate. It is the Messiah who would ultimately come to deal with sin and sacrifice, not daily at the temple, but once for all at the end of the age. He would come and deal with sin and sacrifice once for all as the one who always has and always will represent his chosen people before God who are called in this passage the offspring of Abraham, the sons who must be brought to glory, his brothers, the children that God has given to him. But the question is begged, how can the Son of God do this? How can God the Son represent human beings before God? How can God represent people before God? You see the problem? 
especially in light of the priesthood? Well, Hebrews teaches us how. And the answer is, for the Son of God to finally and ultimately and climatically represent his people before the Father, before God, he had to become like us in every way. He and all of us must be from one, one source, which is the point I think back in Hebrews 2, I think it's verse 11, where it says that the one who sanctifies and the one sanctified are all of one. There's a, there has to be a unity and a solidarity between the Son of God and his people if he is to be their priest, which now leads us to point two. Notice first in verse 17 that the Son, according to our passage, had to become like his brothers, his brethren, in every way. And up to this point in Hebrews, the writer has been showing us that he has become like his brothers. Meaning, namely, flesh and blood. That's been clear enough, as we saw last week. But verse 17 adds something very important, and that is the phrase, in every way, which I think is driving us beyond simple flesh and blood. You'll see what I mean in a second. But I think here it means that to be a merciful and faithful high priest, one who represents his people who are flesh and blood, and one who serves his people, this son in flesh and blood had to become like us, not just in flesh and blood, but even deeper still. In every way, except for sin, of course. Sin and sickness, which is the result of sin. And why? Why is this so important? Why the connection between the Son, who is our priest, the Son taking on flesh and blood, but even more so becoming like us in every way? Why the emphasis there? Well, because the priest had to be from the people. He had to identify with the people. He had to be one with the people. And the incarnate Son was and is one with his people. And that's what Hebrews has been laboring to show us. And the oneness is so real between Christ the Messiah and the people of God, the children of Abraham. It is so real and the solidarity is so great and there is such a union between this incarnate son and his people that he is called a head to a body. A husband to a bride. And that is the greatest union that you can grab at in this life. Would it be problematic if someone separated your head from your body? <laughs> it would be problematic. That lack of union there would cause some problems. But this is the way that the Bible describes the union between the Son of God and his people. It is an unbroken solidarity. And how? Because he becomes like us in every way. He becomes one of us in his incarnation. There is a true oneness. And here it is. Not just because he had a human body, flesh and blood. Not just because of that. But because he also with this flesh and blood body, had a real, true, rational soul, a spirit, a heart, a human spirit that experienced the painful, joyful life of his brethren. The trials, the suffering, the temptations. In other words, in other words, the point is that when you think about this Messiah who takes on flesh and blood, who comes into the world incarnate, he knows as a man, as a real man with flesh and blood and a spirit like yours. This is different from the divine spirit. He had a real human spirit, a human soul. And in case you think I'm off my rocker, Westminster Shorter Catechism 22. 
This is the Reformed tradition. Christ, the Son of God, became man. How? By taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul. And this solidarity, this oneness between the Son and his people, in flesh and blood, and with his reasonable soul, binding him to us as one, it is crucial for him being our priest. Hebrews 5, 1 through 2. This is not on the screen either. But it says this. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God. We've said that. To offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. We've said that. Here it is. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Do you see that solidarity? The point is that the priest can act on the behalf of his people because he is one with them. Now, clearly, and it's implied, and if you're even questioning it, please don't. This always excludes sin. And it always excludes any of the results of sin. There is no sin in the Son of God. There is no results of sin in the Son of God that has to be plain. But he still became like us in every way. So 2.17 is teaching us that the Son was more than just flesh and blood. He wasn't a hollow shell. He was not an empty shell, but he was a real man who became like his brothers in every way, even in his inner being, his, his heart, his soul, his spirit, that he might deal gently with us. Meaning, as our manly high priest, get this, he has been grieved deep in his heart by what he has seen. He has felt compassion toward the crowds who are like sheep with no shepherd. The compassion that often led to healing and feeding those who were around him. He has felt anger and hatred towards sin. Indignation towards sin and its effects in the world which was made through him. Angry at the effects of sin like leprosy, blindness, sickness of different kinds, and even death. I want you to understand that the man Jesus Christ hated sin and death with utter passion. And until you do too, you are not like him. Until you fool, until you are done fooling with sin like it's a game. Until you are done turning a blind eye to suffering, physical and spiritual. You are not like him. And he hated death. And it grieved him to the point of weeping. John 11, 32 through 35. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. That is the Son of God becoming like us in every way. Jesus was not a stoic. He had an emotional life. He had affections, feelings. Even Calvin himself says this. And if Calvin says it, you know it's true. I'm kidding, of course. Not really, but sort of. Calvin says he put on not only human flesh itself, but also the affections which belong to men. Christ was made subject to our human passion, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. Calvin is right, as usual. And he is right because the so that connects in our text, 
The so that connects the son being made like his brothers in every way to him being or becoming a merciful and faithful high priest. They're connected. He is a compassionate, sympathetic high priest because as a man, he was made like us in every way. So get this. If you begin to doubt that he knows you, saint, Christian, believer. If you begin to have thoughts that say, yeah, God says he's merciful and he says he's compassionate, but he ain't no man, so we don't get it. Think things like that or something. Remind yourself of this text. I am not interweaving the divine nature and the human nature. I am not saying that God learns things so that he can grow or change. That's all heresy. And if you think I'm saying that, don't think I'm saying that. This is about the man Christ Jesus. I'm not an open theist, no process theology. God does not need anything outside of himself to learn anything. Amen? Amen. If you think he does, you're a heretic. And we burn heretics. That also was a joke. <laughs> sort of. God burns heretics in hell. If you begin to think things like God is so far away, so far away from me, that there is no way in the world he can actually truly know what I feel or what I am struggling with or what is hurting or what I'm grieved by. I want you to remember this text today, Hebrews 2, 17 and 18, and the man Christ Jesus. When you doubt or if you wonder that he understands life and suffering and misery, I want you to see that the life and the suffering and the testing and the mystery of the misery of Christ, it proves to us without a shadow of a doubt that he is merciful and sympathetic. You can know that he knows because he became like us in every way. Minus sin. In fact, again, Calvin says, it was not because the Son of God needed to experience it to become accustomed to the emotion of mercy. But get this but because he could not persuade us that he is kind and ready to help us unless he had been tested by our misfortunes. Which means that Calvin's point here is that this incarnation and this suffering and this becoming like us in every way was not mainly for Christ's benefit, but for ours, as those who would trust in him. We might see him as merciful and faithful, trustworthy as a high priest. But this leads us to the next point. And that is, how can you know and how can you be sure that this priest who represents us before God, how can you know that he is merciful and faithful? How can you bank your life on it? When you as a Christian wonder how the Son of God can truly be sympathetic to your life, as your priest who is called merciful here, when you wonder how he can really be trusted or if he is trustworthy and faithful. Think about this. Has your family betrayed you? Does it feel like your spouse is your enemy? Do you feel alone? Well, his brothers rejected him. Church. His own people did not receive him. They thought he was insane. He spends 40 days in the wilderness alone with the beasts like the last Adam. Not to mention in his own city and in his own family. He is without honor. He is not received. He's rejected and mocked and ignored. Have some of your closest friends stabbed you in the back? You thought they were one with you. 
And they're here to help and to serve and to lead. Remember the kiss of Judas and the denial of Peter. He knows. Have you struggled and fought hard against your sin? And the temptations of the devil to the point of agony and tears. Just, you cry out that God would take away the struggle. Some of you haven't because you don't care about sin. But some of you have because you hate your sin. And when this comes, remember and see and know that he fought harder. How do you know that? Because he won. <laughs> he won. Which means that his suffering and his struggle were even worse. When you are tempted and you struggle with sin and you give in, that is infinitely easier than what Christ bore. He did not give in. He did not give in to sin when he was tempted from the outside. That's another key point. He's not tempted from the inside like we are as fallen human beings. So I'm, in, I'm assuming you know all of this. It's probably not good on my part here. But he is being tempted from the outside, pressed on the outside. He's not sinful on the inside like we are. But he fought harder and he won. He never caved, but instead he fought like hell all the way to the cross where nails were driven through his hands and his feet. A crown of thorns of cursing was rammed into his skull. And ultimately there he suffers death as the soldiers mocked. And as the passerbys mocked and wagged their heads at him while he was hanging there crucified and naked. He knows the war. Are you grieving over sickness, death, and pain in your family? He had compassion on the sick. He looked upon the sick with indignation because of what sin has done. He often healed them. He wept at the tomb of Lazarus. He knows as a man. Do you feel alone in your pain and in your suffering? What were his disciples doing while he was spending the night in dreadful prayer? They were asleep. <laughs> Always cracks. I have a little note in my wide margin, Cambridge, but right before this, this is where Peter says, I'll never deny you. I'll even die with you. I'll go wherever you go. I'll... And then ironically, Peter can't even stay awake <laughs> while his Savior suffers. Peter was such a doof. So are you. So That's what God saves. He saves doofuses like us. I find that comforting <laughs> when I look at Peter and I look at Abraham and he's trying to pass his wife off as a sister because he's afraid. It's like, well, yeah, there I am. Praise God for the one who isn't like that, who is our Savior. Are you anxious? Are you worried? He prayed to the point of sweating blood, praying that God's cup of wrath would be taken away. Do you feel abandoned? Do you feel lost? Do you feel empty? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The point is he knows. He knows. He was a man of sorrows, a man of grief, a man of pain. Isaiah 53 tells us this. It says he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted as righteous. The point is, this is our high priest, saints. This is who he is. 
the one who is merciful and faithful. He is a God-man who pities us, who is sympathetic and worthy of our trust and hope. And he has proven to us that he is merciful and trustworthy and sympathetic. He has proven it by becoming one with us to show us. He was the man of all men who was sorrowful, yet always rejoicing in his Father. And we need to see this merciful God-man at the right hand of our Father, this God-man who knows us intimately as God incarnate. But the writer of Hebrews goes on. Next point. And that is, he did not just come to assure us that he is merciful and faithful as a priest, but he came to offer sacrifice, which is what the priest did every day or on the Day of Atonement. The high priest would offer a sacrifice. And the text says that he, came to make, he comes to make propitiation for his people. And this is where we have to slow down for a moment. Some of you will enjoy this. Others will want me to hurry. But we have to slow down because depending on what translation you have, and I assume that many of you have the ESV, depending on what translation you have, the word here is translated differently. And we need to understand why. It's very important. If you have the ESV or the NASB, this word is translated as propitiation. Sounds like a bad sneeze. If you have the NIV, it's translated as atonement. Or if you have the King James Version, it's translated as reconciliation. And sometimes in more technical translations, it's translated as expiation. And the question is, why all the different translations? Why all the different terms in place of this word, which is one word in the Greek? Why? Well, in my view, it essentially has to do with the angle from which we're looking at sin. These all play a role in that relationship. It's about the angle from which we are looking at sin and its relationship to God. Here's what I mean. When we think about propitiation, and that's what the ESV takes this word to mean here, propitiation is aimed at God primarily. It has God as its object, meaning propitiation is satisfying divine justice, which results in wrath against sin. And did Jesus come to propitiate? Did he come to take on the wrath of God and so to serve divine justice so that there is no more wrath for us? You better say yes and amen. That's exactly what he did. He bore the wrath and the curse of his father in order that we would not have to. Meaning that at the cross, we don't just see the love of God, gag, but we see love and justice colliding like an atom bomb in the cross of Christ. We see the love of God and the fact that the Son is there, but we see justice and righteousness in the fact that there on the cross, the beloved Son drinks the wrath of God. That is propitiation, satisfying the wrath of God because of divine justice and righteousness. Because God is good, that's the answer. Expiation, why that possibility? Well, expiation is aimed not necessarily at God and satisfying his divine justice and his wrath against sin, but expiation is aimed at the guilt of sin itself. It is the removal of that guilt. It is to take the guilt away from the sinner. And did Jesus come to take the guilt of sin away from us? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. The guilt of sin is washed away in his blood. We no longer stand guilty before God, but we stand counted as righteous before God because of Christ. He positively did what we could not do, and he bore the wrath, the curse, and the guilt that was ours. Or as the old hymn says, in our place, condemned he stood. So they're not that far apart, 
The question is, what is being focused on? Is it the guilt of sin? Is it the wrath of God? What is the focus? And that changes the way you translate that word. And finally, where sin is dealt with, where the guilt of sin is taken away, and the justice of God is satisfied, well then what's the result? Well, the result is what the King James or the NIV say, and that is atonement or reconciliation. This bringing God and his people back together because his wrath is satisfied and their guilt is taken away. So in one sense, in one sense, they're all right. Meaning, because of the work of our high priest before God, there is no more wrath, there is no more guilt for sin, and therefore there is no more alienation from God. We are reconciled to him. We come back to him. We have relationship with him by faith because of the work of the Messiah. We are now free to come into his presence, the presence of God with our priest Jesus, where later the writer of Hebrews will call us to come to the throne of grace boldly. And how in the world can you filthy sinner do that? Because of this. And how did he accomplish this as our high priest? How did he deal with this sin and its guilt? How was the day of atonement or the day of propitiation? It's the same Greek word in Hebrews and the Septuagint. How does he deal with this sin as our priest? Well, the answer is that he did not come into the world taking on flesh and blood, that he might offer a lamb or a ram, a sacrifice to God which was the pattern in the Old Testament. But Hebrews teaches us that he comes into the world suffering and being tempted and tested with his eyes on the ultimate goal of offering up himself as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of his people. He is the Lamb of God. Remember that scene in Genesis 22 where God tells Isaac he will provide for us a lamb. And then what's caught in the thicket? It's a trick question. It ain't no lamb. It's a ram. Why? Because the lamb has not yet come. But now he has. He is the lamb. The son of God is the lamb. Hebrews 9, 11, and 12. It says, But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, Then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. And why did he do that? Because he is our priest. The one who represents us before God, specifically in relationship to sin and sacrifice. He is the sacrificed, and he is the priest. We'll see later that the sacrifice is always before God now. All of this is summarized in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Question 25, it says, how does Christ execute the office of a priest? Answer, Christ executes the office of a priest in his once offering up himself as a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and reconciling us to God and in making continual intercession for us. And that last part leads me into part five of the message, and that is not his past work. Not his past suffering and temptation and testing. And not even his death on the cross as the priestly sacrifice for sin. But his present ministry. Verse 18, I think, explains clearly how the earthly life of Christ and all that he did and all that he went to, it now explains to us not his earthly ministry past, but his heavenly priestly ministry present. And here's why I say this. If you look at verse 18, it says, because of his suffering when tempted, that's past, he is able. 
What tense is that? Present. He is presently able because of that. Presently able to help those who are present participle, presently and continually being tempted. And what does this mean? It means that Christ is still working. Do you believe that? He is still serving. It means that his priesthood did not end after his death as a sacrifice for sin, but now after his resurrection and ascension, which are assumed in the text, he ascends into the presence of the Father and his priesthood is eternal. He is always serving in the presence of his Father on behalf of his people. And because he is the sacrifice, the sacrifice of God now completed is always before the face of God. It's amazing to me, if you read Isaiah 53 carefully, the way it ends. And watch this. 53, 12. I'm just going to focus on the last part. He poured out his soul to death. That's past. It's what he did in his earthly ministry, right? And he was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of, mid, of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Do you notice that? It just flies right by if you're not careful. He died Implied resurrection, implied ascension, he makes intercession. That's what Isaiah said he would do. And that's what Hebrews is saying. He is the fulfillment of this prophecy and this promise. Which means that his intercession, his priestly work on our behalf before the Father, it is not finished, but he is presently, actively serving and ministering. And he is doing it as a sympathetic, affectionate, understanding priest. He knows. <laughs> the man Christ Jesus who has suffered, who was tested and tempted from the outside, he is now in heaven at the right hand of his father. And this man who was tested and tempted, becoming like us in every way, he is able, he is powerful. To help us. To help us now. Those who are presently being tempted and tested and suffering like he was. Which means our priest is still in his temple daily ministering to the saints. That's amazing. It's amazing to me. He's not coming back later to minister. I mean he is. but He's not in purgatory waiting for his chance to minister and reign as king or something. It's a present reality. This is why I'm always on the case of the dispensationalists. They're just wrong. How does he do this? Well, I'm going to give you a handful of ways. How does the high priest serve his people and minister to his people who are on earth in their trials and in their suffering and in their temptations? How does he do it? Well, I think here are some ideas. He sends his spirit. See that in Acts 2? He sends his spirit, the life-giving spirit. The spirit who gives strength and power under trial and testing. The spirit of self-control and the spirit of power and joy. That's how he does it. He gives his spirit from heaven that he might serve us and minister to us through and by his spirit. Or again, he gives us his word. Or he gives us a word from the scriptures at the right time when we need it most. Sometimes in a sermon. Sometimes in Sunday school. Sometimes in our Tuesday morning breakfast and Bible study. Sometimes in personal Bible reading. Sometimes in a book that we're reading. Sometimes in a podcast where his word is read or explained or sometimes he simply brings to our mind a verse that we have read in the past that we did not even know that we knew deep in our souls. When that happens, that is the priest in heaven serving us, ministering to us by his spirit and through his word. Or how about this one, one we hate the most, I think, especially in our American individualism. He works in and through the saints around us. Those who serve us with their hands and feet, 
who are filled with the Spirit of Christ himself, those who exhort us, those who help us, those who pray for us, those who love us, The priest from heaven corrects us and disciplines us in love, Hebrews 12. A painful love sometimes. He feeds us in the Lord's Supper, giving us grace and strength as we eat in faith, grace and strength to live for him in the week to come, a week of testing and temptation in the wilderness. These are all the ways he serves us and ministers to us from heaven. He marks us and washes us clean in baptism. Something to which we can look back to over and over again. A sign and seal of the covenant to which we belong. The promise of justification, sanctification, a new life in the spirit which has been placed upon us. And what church is the ultimate aim and goal of his present ministry and intercession from heaven by the Spirit to earth? What is the ultimate goal? Here it is. It is that when all is said and done, that he might bring us to where he is, that we might be with him forever. That's the ultimate aim and goal. Justified, sanctified, glorified, and in the presence of the Lamb forever. That is his goal. This is not just ours. This is why I believe in particular atonement and the perseverance of the saints. This is his work. If you think you can lose your salvation, then you think that Christ can lose you. I'm sorry. I think that's foolish. The high priest who has paved the way, entering heavenly Canaan through his present ministry, will bring us through the wilderness by all the means he has provided. How do you know this, saints? How do you know that he will get you from where you are, if you are his, through this wasteland wilderness to where he is? How can you know that? Because he has prayed that it would happen. John 17, 24. This is the God-man Jesus Christ praying to his Father in heaven as our priest. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am. There it is. Why? To see my glory. A glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. That is how he prays for you, saint. Father, I desire that Mace would be where I am, that he might see my glory, because you have given him to me. (laughs) Do you know this? This is the way the priest prays for his people. And do we think that God says no to his son? Of course not. So take heart. Because your Savior is still serving you from heaven. He's not done. He is still ministering. He is helping you. He is bringing you aid in a million ways you don't even know about. If you're foolish, you just think it's random chance, or it's a coincidence, or I can't believe this happened on this day, and all this lines up so perfectly. It's almost like it's from God or something. It is the priest serving his saints from his holy temple. And if you belong to him, he will bring you home. From our side, the path looks narrow and dark. Filled with monsters, tests and temptations and pain and suffering, cancer, cares of this life. But 
take heart. Because our priest, by his spirit, leads us as a fire by night and as a cloud by day, drawing us to himself from here to heaven. And where he is, we will be also forever. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our God, your word is beyond amazing. The hope that it brings to weary saints. Those who are ready to throw in the towel. Those who are ready to be done. Because life is so brutal. It brings us hope because we see here, God, that our priest is not passively waiting for us, but that he is presently and actively serving us and bringing us by his spirit and through all of the other means he has chosen to where he is in the presence of his Father. Father, I pray that this would give us strength to press on, that it would renew our souls and our hope, that we would keep our eyes fixed upon our priest who has gone where we are to be, a priest who will bring us to where he is, who we might see you and know you and be in your presence and enjoy you in a way we have not yet, forever and ever. And all God's people said,